Hi, welcome to Political Correctness, part of this year's Digital Festival of Dangerous Ideas. The theme for this year's festival is Dangerous Realities, which means that the FODI team are essentially clairvoyants because that basically sums up 2020 to date. So far this year, Australia has had fire, flood and now plague. It's all getting pretty biblical around here. And amidst all of this, the culture wars are raging as strongly as ever. In a time when we're all online and a misplaced comma can see a fight that lasts for days, do we need to reset our notion of what you can and what you can't say? <clears throat> Please join me in welcoming our panel. Chris Kenny, columnist for the Australian newspaper and host of Sky News. Lauren Rose Wan, Senior Lecturer in Political Science at the University of Melbourne. Kevin Donnelly, Conservative Commentator and Senior Research Fellow at the Australian Catholic University. And standing in for Osman Faruqi, who unfortunately can't talk right now, is Antoinette Latouf, Senior Journalist at Channel 10 and co-founder of Media Diversity Australia. Thank you all. The ABC's recent Australia Talk survey of more than 54,000 Australians found that more than two-thirds of us believe political correctness has gone too far and other people are too easily offended. But when asked should people be able to say what they think, even if it offends others, 45% of us said yes, 45% of us said no, and 10% of us essentially just shrugged, which leaves us in a really confusing place. Lauren Rosewan, let's start with you. The term political correctness has been around for decades. So has it finally jumped the shark or have we not gone far enough? I'm not sure we're even all in agreement about what we mean when we use the term political correctness. Um, sometimes people are using it as this sort of snowflake criticism as though um, the current generation are just too weak. And then there's the other use of the term, which is seemingly an acknowledgement that there are actually consequences to speech. So I think it's difficult as an academic, I always have this sort of what's our starting point? How are we defining this term? And I'm not sure actually there is universal agreement on how we even use this term. Well, how would you define it? I don't have a single definition. For me, I think I seem to default. If someone asks me what do I think of the term, I think I think of it as being used as a weapon. And I don't think it's it, it seems to be quite distant from ever whatever the origins of the term was. Now it seems to be used as a, as a bit of a football. I think it's an uh, a cautionary note is a, is about as much as I can get from the term anymore. It's just been used to in too many different ways. Mm. Kevin Donnelly, I want to bring you in here. Uh, you've written that political correctness is destroying education and children's futures and Australia in general. Uh, should there be an absolute right to freedom of speech here in Australia as there is in the United States? Well, I, <clears throat> sorry, I agree with George Orwell on this, who basically said that uh, he might disagree with what you say, but you have every right to say it. So I think in a liberal democracy, uh, freedom of speech is vital and we shouldn't have a situation where we do currently, and it's been there for many years now, where people are flamed or attacked or criticised, possibly even losing their job because they might say something that other people find offensive. And in terms of a definition, I go back to the American academic, Denise D'Souza, who said over 20 years ago that political correctness was a form of uh, language control, of uh, manipulating how people think. And it goes back even further to the Frankfurt School in Germany during the 1930s when uh, Antonio Di Gramsci, the Italian communist, said that the cultural left had to take the long march through the institutions. And by controlling language, by enforcing groupthink, that's what they've achieved. Well, Chris Kenny, what do you think of that? Is political correctness a way of enforcing groupthink? Should we just make everything fair game? Yeah, look, I think uh, Kevin's use of the word uh, groupthink is spot on. That's what political correctness is, is the attempt to corral thought and debate in one direction. It's essentially the dominance of left of centre views through 
our schooling, our education, our media, our public debate. That's what it is. And it's a it's, it's an insidious uh, pressure that's uh, exercised largely through the media political class to try and uh, uh, try and delegitimise alternative political points of view. We see it each and every day. It's stultifying of the debates. It crushes ideas, and it's it, it's used in in a bullying way. And I think we've just got to uh, be more robust about our views and about our debates. Uh, uh, and the reason the reason we know that. Um, there are bigger and better ideas out there is that um, the political media class, the, those people so caught up in political correctness, seem to get all the big political movements wrong. They're completely out of step with mainstream Australians, but it occurs in Western Europe and the US as well. The, the mainstream views that are so often shunned in the political, politically correct world of the media political class they're the ones that triumph, whether it's through the election of Donald Trump, the re-election of the Morrison government, the, the, the uh, victory of the Brexit referendum. None of these views were shared by the politically correct the media political class. Uh, people uh, shunned that and, uh, and stood up for things like strong borders, national sovereignty, uh, uh, economic freedom and personal freedom. So the, the political class is out of step with the mainstream, but they try to dominate uh, debate and education uh, and media through the imposition of their green left political views. Uh, the most recent example of this is classic, right? We're all living through this now with the coronavirus epidemic. When Australia first decided to rescue Australian citizens from Wuhan and bring them back to Australia uh, and put them through quarantine at Christmas Island, we had all sorts of people saying that this was a racist thing to do. This was this a racist thing to do, to rescue Australians and put them through quarantine. Even the Australian Medical Association said as much. At the same time, when we were banning flights from China to try and protect our country from this virus, the World Health Organization said that those bans were wrong and said that they spread fear and, and the bigotry. Uh, when people suggested that they might want to stay clear of Chinese New Year celebrations in New York, New York, the mayor said that that was a racist thing to do. People should get out on the streets and embrace a, a Chinese so, New Year. So that's a very classic so example. So, Chris, Kennedy, does, does that mean then that the World Health Organization? Does that mean then that the World Health Organization and the Australian government are part of this green left conspiracy and the Australian Medical Association? Surely there's a space where well, not everyone is part of groupthink. Now, the Australian government, I was saying, was doing a sensible thing. Their critics tried to say that this was racist. Uh, and, and their critics, among their critics, was the World Health Organization that said bans of, on travel out of China uh, were, were inflaming bigotry. This is political correctness gone mad. We're trying to stop a virus. And he had none other than the World Health Organization and even the Australian Medical Association suggesting that there was some bigotry involved. It's madness and it has dire consequences. And to the two, if I want to bring you in here, you're the co-founder of Media Diversity Australia. Do you think that everything should be open slather and how we talk about coronavirus, for instance? Look, uh, I think when it comes to political correctness, it's often difficult to distinguish between controversial ideas, and I think there should be a space for them. But how do we separate what's a controversial idea and what is malicious bigotry? And I don't think there's a one size fits all answer because homophobia, racism does exist. Um, and so I think it's not so much a, a discussion about whether political correctness has gone mad, I think we also need to talk about who is able to put forward what they think. And I, th and I think that's part of the problem. And Chris touched on that earlier when he talked about the media uh, being a media elite or in a bubble that isn't connected with or reflecting the greater Australian population. And we've seen similar things happen in Europe and in North America, where as a consequence, there've been enormous political and economic shifts that mainstream journalists just weren't privy to. And so that's part of what we're trying to achieve in Media Diversity Australia. We think because so often our media is dominated by inner city progressive elites who are often disconnected from the communities they report on, 
that they don't have their finger on the pulse. And so often these are the same people who are really mouthy and shouty on social media with their very progressive views, be it about Christmas Island or refugees or the Muslim community. Um, but too often we're not hearing from the community themselves speak. And I think once we have um, a more representative, nuanced discussion, I think then we can talk about whether or not political correctness has gone mad. Because right now, I don't think all the right people are, um, are at the table and not all the right people uh, have been elevated to be part of this discussion. Lauren, you've written that in terms of political correctness, the left is eating itself, but you also deploy, for instance, content warnings or trigger warnings in your lectures before you talk about topics like sexual assault. Is that something you do by choice or is that a directive that uh, you need to follow? No, there's no directive at my university that we need to, to do this. I do it because I think it's only fair to let students know what I'm going to cover and that that material might be sensitive. And I do that. I don't use the term trigger warning when I do it. I do it as a content warning. And I think it's just as we would do in any film or television show. There might be content here that you might find upsetting, in which case you as an adult need to make a decision as to whether you stay. Now, you mentioned earlier that I'd you know written about the, the left eating each other alive. And I think that sort of addresses the point Chris made he seemed to assume that there was a, a left position and that, 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 <laughs> that there was a sort of a single progressive view and this isn't the case and I think this is one of those problems with debates against political correctness or framing that it's gone awry as though everyone on that side on, on the left is somehow all meeting on Tuesday nights and all agreeing as to what we're you know what our agenda is and this absolutely doesn't mm -hmm. occur this is an you know a, a fabricated enemy as opposed to something that's actually real so one I mean, of the, I, I mean, yes. If I could there, uh, in, in the politically correct dictionary that I put together, I actually acknowledge that point. So I'm not saying it's totally left or right. I mean, Camille Paglia, who uh, is a famous American feminist, uh, she was lesbian. Now I think she's gender neutral. I mean, Camille Paglia actually condemns political correctness and the broad left to denying free speech on, on university campuses. Now, similarly, in England, uh, Jermaine Greer has been no platform, and she is one of Australia's most famous feminists in terms of the work she's done over many years. So even on the left, you have this debate about free speech and about what is acceptable and unacceptable. My argument is that, in fact, it uh, isn't just black and white but it's a very uh, concerted campaign, as Chris mentioned, to indoctrinate young people in particular. I reviewed the national curriculum four years ago, and it was obvious that the national curriculum in Australia from prep to year 10 is very much about what is considered by the cultural left to be the politically correct approach in terms of indigenous studies, uh, feminism, uh, Australia, Western Civ, Christianity. I mean, even at universities now, we do have sensitivity toolkits where lecturers and tutors are, are warned that they cannot uh, lord Western civilization. They're told that Captain Cook uh, invaded Australia. They, I mean, they get the history wrong all the time. But the reality is, as George Orwell discovered many years ago when he was writing about Stalin and Hitler in Europe, the first thing a totalitarian government does or regime does is to go back to ground zero, what they did in Cambodia, get rid of the intellectuals, control what is happening in universities and schools, and to get back to Antonio Gramsci, who I mentioned originally, that idea of the long march through the institutions. And that's what's happened. Uh, that's why 68% of Australians who were surveyed by the ABC actually said, political correctness has gone too far. I, I want to bring Lauren uh, Rose one in I? here because I, I'm, I'm not sure whether I mean, has anyone set foot like... into a university? Oh, well, this is what I was about to say. Where is this playbook that I'm getting at the university? I mean, I've worked at universities now for 20 years. I've never seen this playbook. Where is this playbook? It seems like there's a lot of speculation from people who are outside of universities as to what goes on in them. And I'm really not sure any of this has ever happened in any classroom I've set foot in in 20 years. 
Yeah, no, well, I'm actually at the University about, in Melbourne, political and political I mentioned like four, or five yeah. 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 four or five examples. There are four or five examples in the book. Monash University, Flinders University, Queensland University, Sydney University. If you buy the book, you'll be able to read what they say about sensitivity okay. toolkit. Um, I want to ask Lauren a question about some people view political correctness as a way of showing respect to groups which may have it tough, uh, have had it tough in the past or have it tough online now. Lauren, should everything, have we reached a point where everything is fair game or do we still need to protect some people in certain spaces? What do we mean by fair game? I mean, I think... I don't see, for example, there there seems to be this this assumption that there are people who can't say certain things now. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of people getting away with saying a lot. The difference is now they are getting called out for it. So this idea, though, that they're being policed, they're not being jailed, right? They're being called out for using, you know, be it uh, offensive language, we'll just use that term for the moment, offensive language, and being called out for it and being held accountable for it. That's not taking away your right to say anything. And I think this is a really interesting, we sort of seem to boil this debate down as though people are being silenced, where in fact the difference is you're not being silenced, you're being held accountable. They're two different things. You're, you're being challenged. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. You're being challenged. I, I would also point out that a lot of these so, you know, so-called culture wars and political correctors often play out on Twitter. And it's easy to forget in our circles, in academia, in politics and in media, just how few regular Australians are on Twitter. Only about 20% of Australians are on Twitter, so that's one in five. So most people don't engage in these often horrible discussions which descend into name calling and picking people up as to where they put their apostrophe. So I think too often we're too far into this bubble. We're calling out people on the left or the right saying, you're a bigot, you're, you're muzzling me. Um, but it's, it's, it's not a conversation I think that's felt necessarily um, or an issue that's felt as strongly in the broader community and amongst, if I you know, dare use the expression, regular Australians. Do you think there is a, a cancel culture going on, Antoinette, in broader society or is it just that generationally there is a difference um, and some people haven't received the memo? Uh, what do you mean by cancel culture? I mean, people often say things, this, this person's cancelled, you know, Australia Day's cancelled. Um, in terms of rhetoric online, yes, there is. Um, there is... Uh, a cancel culture. But again, I think it's counterproductive. I think all social media does is divide people. We aren't able to have intelligent, nuanced discussions. We name call. We say, you're a leftist, you're a righteous, you're a neo-Nazi, you're a feminazi. Um, and people aren't able to find common ground. What I've experienced is often these people who are the shoutiest or the angriest, and let's be honest, that makes you popular on social media. Once you speak to them in person, some of these some of these people are actually incredibly timid in person and really quite reasonable. Um, so I try and actually spend less time online and less time engaging in that cancel culture because I just don't think it's productive. And I think that all social media does and social media algorithms do, and we've got plenty of studies to show, is it makes us more polarised, it makes us less tolerant, and it, it, it doesn't allow us to try and even empathise with somebody else's position, which I think is a huge part of this and why people think that political correctness has gone mad and they can't say anything without being corrected. Hmm. Well, we're all online at the moment, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, and a few days ago, we saw a particular pile on because the Victorian Deputy Chief Health Officer uh, likened the arrival of Captain James Cook on Australian shores to the arrival of COVID-19 in a tweet. Chris, she posted this tweet on a day off. Is she allowed to have an opinion on a day off without being cancelled? Oh, she's allowed to have an opinion uh, and she should have a better informed opinion and she perhaps should have been paying more attention to the Cedar Meats outbreak in Melbourne rather than uh, promoting political views like that. And I would have thought she's on a warning now because she's a senior public servant. But I just want to go back over a couple of these points we've just heard here. Firstly, social media, Twitter, it's not relevant. So this is not where real people uh, discuss politics or, or anything else. This is where the green left echo chamber exists. This is where if you want to see how extreme some of the views are of uh, 
of uh, publicly funded journalists and the like, or that you can get an insight of that through Twitter, but it's it's not a relevant there, part, there, part there of our plenty of, debate, really. There are plenty of there are plenty of conservative people on Twitter too who are just as angry as the, yeah, you know, yeah, the, the militant left. Yet, There's yeah, just but, as many militant right. Yeah, well, yeah. There's all sorts of loony tunes in there, but it's it's predominantly in, in the political sphere, predominantly uh, young and hard left, and, and all sorts of studies have borne that out, and uh, and that's why it's not particularly useful. But the, the point is about universities too. I don't want to get Lauren get away with this, uh, this idea that there's no political correctness in universities. We only have to look at the at, at the curricula there. We only have to look at the subjects on offer and the focus on identity politics, whether it's through gender studies or or whatever else through just about every part of the uh, of uh, the university agenda, but also just a couple of uh, real life examples. We've had the, the the quite disturbing situation over the past few years, where a number of Australian universities have actually rejected the opportunity to have leading institutions and fund and the funding that comes with them because of politically correct backlashes. One was Bjorn Longberg's uh, uh, Copenhagen Centre setting up a a branch in Australia, and the other, of course, was the uh, Ramsey Centre for uh, Western Civilization, which has finally been established at the Wollongong University and uh, and up in Queensland as well. But you know, seriously, we had you know um, some of our most prestigious universities, Sydney University, the ANU, actually reject a centre for the awesome. study of Western Civilization because of a politically surely backed that shows uh, their. Politically Surely that shows their ability to be able to exercise their choice. And, and the fact that those institutions finally found a home, as you say, at Wollongong University, for instance, does show that we have uh, a pluralism in our public debate and in our intellectual life, no? Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. The fact that they exist is not I mean, it is quite the opposite. I mean, Sydney University was quite happy to take the Chinese Confucian Centre money, yes. as were the other universities Confucian. around Australia. And so they're happy to take money from China, but not from uh, an Australian, uh, you know, uh, centre, the Ramsey Centre, that wanted to promote Western civilisation. And in terms of university, you only have to look at Sydney last year, their marketing exercise, which was all about unlearn. So it was saying to students who come to Sydney Uni, We'll do refugees, we'll do Indigenous studies, we'll do multiculturalism, unlearn everything you have learnt at school. <clears throat> Not that that was much. but uh, it, And they have faculties there in okay. whiteness, it, it, is which it, is it, all about is it, Western is it, is culture it about... being Eurocentric, patriarchal, misogynist, binary, homophobic, Islamophobic. I mean, I could keep talking about this for hours. Antoinette. Is it about unlearning? Oh, is it un about unlearning? Can I, can I, so is it about unlearning or is it about broadening our lens to actually acknowledge what Australian society looks like? We have an incredibly multicultural society. We have uh, a significant refugee population. We have an LGBT, LGBT community. We have a horrendous history of, um, in terms of the way not only have we treated Indigenous people, but how we've written them in, in or written them out of our history. I don't see it as problematic as also offering these subjects to actually reflect and bring Australia up to speed. And it, it, I can't help but notice that those who are most uncomfortable with gender studies or Indigenous history, it seems to be older white men in power. They seem to be the ones who are incredibly uncomfortable with the next generation actually being taught things that influence and impact or actually connect to their lived experience. I, for one, would love for my, my children to go to university and learn things like that. That doesn't mean we forget our Christian learn colonial like past. What? That doesn't mean we forget. It doesn't mean, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that we forget um, the importance of colonisation and that we, we obviously all wouldn't be here if um, Captain James Cook didn't do what he did. But I think it's important to also acknowledge the other parts of our history and our modern history and just how much modern Australia is changing. I, for one, am not uncomfortable with our universities offering those courses. And if you don't want to learn that, go and enrol somewhere else. Go and enrol in another degree. There I are plenty of universities and plenty of uni and plenty of degree no, no, no. offer. That's just gibberish. That's just gibberish. That's exactly the sort of uh, gibberish we expect from these politically correct uh, university courses. You've, you've just not addressed the point. there's a complete misunderstanding. No, no there's no propaganda going on in classrooms. We all teach critical thinking skills. That's what we're there for. The idea that there are different lenses to look at different things 
is a very different reality than thinking that I go there and say, these are the thoughts of Chairman Rosewarne. That doesn't happen. I don't know what university this is ima you're imagining that this takes place in. So why did Peter well, Reid uh, get sacked from Queensland okay. University? I would like to bring us back I mean, away what? from the university sector and away from their advertising campaigns, whatever they may be, and back to our current circumstances in the pandemic. At this particular time, uh, Antoinette, do we have a greater responsibility to be careful with our public speech or is it more important than ever now to state what we think is the truth? I think that depends. I mean, as, as a journalist or as a regular Australian, I think it's it's really difficult, um, particularly with social media, where journos openly share their opinions online um, and then are also expected to be straight, you know, straight news reporters. And I think that's been a, a bit of a problem. We could really tell people's politics and positions on issues online. And, and I think that um, is probably not great for our craft. Um, so if you don't mind clarifying whether you think Australians generally or the media should um, call it as it is. Um, and Kevin, what, what do you think on that? Should we allow speech sorry, sorry, that Sarah. could have real-world consequences? Oh. Yes. So, sorry, Sarah, I just wanted you to clarify whether you think, sorry, your question was framed for Australians more broadly or those in the media. Uh, for everyone. Everyone has a platform online, so surely everyone has a similar amount, sometimes more influence than journalists in public spaces. Um, I think that they should they should be able to say what they think, but I um, I'm not sure that oh, it's a difficult one because I don't want everyone just to go online and be horrible bigots and defame people. And another thing that's really interesting is when people do have those platforms, and as you say, some people who aren't journos um, have quite a following and can be quite influential. Uh, if somebody goes after a, a regular person or a cafe owner or whatever, um, so often there's little recourse. Um, but it's uh, when it comes to defamation, it's generally the, the powerful and the elite who have the deep pockets and are more litigious. So it's the pollies and the, and the media commentators that if I I, for example, go online and have an enormous spray at somebody um, in one of those positions, I'll be held to task in the eyes of the law, but then there's very little recourse for regular Australians. So in that regard, it's it's quite unfair and not a level playing field in, in terms of in terms of the consequences for somebody going out and saying things that are completely untruthful and can and can defame your character. Well, Kevin, just what do you up, think? Uh, Should we allow a speech there. that has real world consequences? Yes. I, I want to know what you think about. For instance, Donald Trump's remarks on bleach the other weekend, uh, which he said were just sarcasm, but uh, in Kansas, health authorities say led to a 40% increase in poison calls to the National Poisons Control um, Helpline, the State Poisons Control Helpline, sorry. Do you think we should be more mindful of our speech in a time like this? Well, we should be, absolutely, and uh, I, I didn't agree with what, President Trump had to say. I thought it was quite foolish. But just two points, if I could. When I reviewed the national curriculum, uh, as I mentioned, I'm all in favour of looking at refugees or Indigenous studies, uh, the environment. But what people have to realise is that those cross-curricular priorities, they inform every subject. Now, what happens there is there is an undervaluing. Uh, Christianity is mentioned three times from prep to year 10 in all subjects, from history, math, science, whereas there are hundreds and hundreds of references to Indigenous culture, spirituality. So it's a matter of balance. We need to look more carefully at not indoctrinating young people in particular with this ideological view about Australia and about Western culture. Now, the second thing is that when you look at political correctness, it's not just university. I've never argued that. And that's why I was fascinated that over 68% of those viewers and listeners to the ABC thought it had gone too far. And you only have to look at the federal election recently to see what happened in Western Sydney, in uh, Northern Queensland, to see that a lot of rural, regional, but also inner city uh, suburbs that historically voted Labor or centre left voted Conservative. That's because when you looked at the surveys, and the ALP's uh, 
review of the election, they realised that what Bill Shorten had done was to appeal to the inner city elites, the centre left, and that he'd forgotten the middle ground, what John Howard called the quiet Australians. I mean, political correctness is rife. Young boys in particular have to be careful. If they say a young girl is attractive, they're misogynist, they're sexist. If they open a door for a girl, they're, they're looked at as though they've done something strange. The public service in Victoria has a they day where taxpayers' money is spent teaching hundreds and hundreds of public servants not to use gender-specific pronouns. They have to say they instead of he or she. I mean, political correctness, uh, our most famous comedian, uh, Barry McKenzie, as I call him, he, was, he lost his name. It was taken off the Melbourne Comedy Festival because apparently he criticised transgenderism. I mean, political correctness, it's all around us. At a barbecue, at a dinner party, at work, you have to be now. Zip the lip, be careful what you say. Lauren Rosewan, you specialise in political science and gender and online spaces and public debate. What do you think? Do you think Kevin's right? I just, I, I, I honestly can't encapsulate how infuriating it is that white men are not acknowledging all this political correctness is, is asking them to think about others and not just themselves. And this is seen to be such massive, massive, uh, such a massive compromise for them to think about actually your words and actions have consequences and there are some people who have been marginalised and treated appallingly for many, many years based on your speech. And the only difference is now you're being called out for it. They, the words were still hurtful hmm. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, but the victims of that speech now have a platform to call you out. And suddenly your whole world is turned upside down. And it, I just, I, this is so it's what words, disturbing. What words, what words were so offensive? What words? I mean, do you agree with Qantas, the manual, that you can't say to someone, husband, wife? Uh, what words were so offensive? Why can't oh, actually, we Kevin, I'd like to ask you a question there. My people. I, I don't I, under- I, I, No, we have a question from the audience, which I think I'd like Kevin to, to have a stab at there. This is a question from Zoe. Yeah. She would like to know where you draw the line where free speech ends and hate speech begins. Well, obviously, we have 18C that uh, tries to do that. I think it goes too far. Uh, We have to be reasonable. We have to be... Well, you tell me. Uh, I don't believe you you should harass people unfairly. I don't believe you should victimise them. I don't believe you should label them. Uh, You know, I don't believe you should... I'll give you an example. When I launched the book uh, last year, Politically Correct Dictionary and Guide, I talked about an American academic who, when teaching Huckleberry Finn, used the word Now, he got into a lot of trouble, as I did when I mentioned that word, and I was uh, criticised in the Fairfax press for using the word but it was in context. I would never use that word. It's totally unacceptable in, in normal conversation. But what's happening now is that even in academia, you have to be very careful what you say or what you write about. Now, when I grew up, and I don't want to offend anyone, uh, in Broadmeadows, working class area, I put my foot up on a divan. We used to call them poofs. Now, I would never use that word now because people find it offensive. So, sure, never denigrate, never offend, but let's have free speech. To get back to George Orwell, I might disagree with what you say, uh, and I think Rousseau as well, but you have every right to say it. Antoinette, do you agree that we can use terms that would be offensive nowadays if we place them in historical context? Um, I'm not sure, and I haven't um, read what Kevin referred to. Um, So, I mean, I do think you can use them in context if it's clear what the context is. Um, But, you know, I haven't seen the example, um, so it would be hard to comment more specifically, but just broadly, I'm less interested in semantics and more interested in the underlying issue. So whether a boy can say a woman, you know, a teenage girl looks hot in that dress or whether instead he should say that is a lovely dress, it is less, 
I'm far less concerned about that and much more concerned about misogynistic behaviour, gendered violence, issues that we know plague Australian society. So I don't want to get caught, too caught up in, you can, this is the list of things you can say, this is the list of things that everyone will jump on you if you, you, know, if you do or don't say. I'm much more interested in having inter, nuanced and intelligent debate about these very real issues and how they impact people's lives. Because we spend an enormous amount of time pointing fingers at who is politically correct, who is politically incorrect, and it's easy to forget what the actual issues are and who who those communities or individuals are that are really impacted. So how do we take that debate deeper, Lauren Rosewine? Yeah, I, I would agree in the sense that I think there is a lack of nuance in a lot of debates around this topic. I think we do get hijacked on the words you can't say, words that you can't, although I would say that some of the behaviour and the words attached are actually symptomatic of a big problem that we've got, which leads to those bigger ticket items. So I, I, I don't think we can sideline sure. the the conversation um, completely. I, I don't, there isn't really an answer here because I think that our political, our whole political mm. culture and discourse has actually become more polarised at the moment. So I think, you know, uh, creating spaces where people feel they can speak is important, but we have those spaces. Those spaces. I think the issue is, or perhaps the the answer is, asking people to use them responsibly. And again, I know we won't agree on a definition of responsible use. Uh, and well, I, I just one of the issues I think we. So go go ahead, Sarah. I just wanted to ask Chris a question. Uh, you took legal action against the ABC after a sketch by the Chaser team depicted you mounting a dog and you won not one but two apologies from the ABC as well as a payout. Uh, you have your own platform on The Australian and also on Sky News, which you could have used to counter the Chaser. So why did you decide to take that example of speech to court? Uh, because I wanted to make a point against the ABC, because I wanted to score a hit against them, because I wanted them to pull their heads in, because I wanted them to stop uh, trying to bully anybody who disagreed with them. It's a classic case of political correctness. Now, I think it was Lauren, sorry, I can't see everyone here, but I think it was Lauren there before was getting very, very narky, suggesting that they're making some sort of racist, sexist, ageist comments, uh, suggesting that white old men apparently are saying things she doesn't like. I don't know what they are. People are saying things. If you disagree with them, then say so. And uh, the reason I took that action is because the ABC decided that because I criticised the ABC, I should be called a dog fucker on national television. And they showed a picture of me as a dog fucker and kept calling me a dog fucker. And so I thought I would sue them to shut them up. And um, it was quite an interesting little exercise. Uh, but that's one of the things we have on the free shutting down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> respectfully, Chris. Sorry? Respectfully, Chris. I haven't seen the cartoon. Respectfully, I haven't seen the cartoon. I, I don't know how you were depicted. Um, but that also goes back to my earlier point that when it comes to um, freedom of expression and people shouldn't be muzzled by political correctness, those who are able to seek recourse or sue are people like yourself. People who are privileged who have a who have a platform. But when other media commentators do it to regular folk or marginalised people or marginalised communities. They don't have the resources or the platform to, to get back at them or to hold them to account like you did. So uh, whatever your decision with the ABC is your decision and I respect it but, it, but it goes back to the point that it's not a level playing field when it comes to free speech because but, you know, most people so what? So what? argue well, that most issue. Australians yes, don't have the resources. Yes. Defamation is another issue. That's a constraint on free speech, and I think most of us would agree that there, there, there ought to be some sort of uh, reform of defamation law. Uh, you know, I doubt, strictly speaking, whether what Even the ABC you have did to me was a in court. But the point is about political correctness, and the point is that the ABC is a vast government uh, behemoth that pushes out a, 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 a group think of political views. Uh, someone earlier was talking about the, uh, the great vibrancy and diversity of ideas in this country. Well, you just don't keep them on the ABC. And instead, when someone criticises them, they try and silence you. So it's a classic case of where political correctness is not just a, a minor problem, it's actually a massive suffocating blanket on free speech and public debate in this country. Lauren Rosewan, 
final word from you. Uh, do you think that freedom of speech is being suffocated by political correctness in this country? No, a corrective is occurring and I think that people who haven't had a voice are having one now and some of those people are using that voice to counter the, the dominant narrative in the Australian media and yeah, some people don't like being, a, a, um, being called out for their words. Well, that is all we have time for um, in this political correctness session. I think we will have to agree to respectfully disagree on this. Please thank my panellists, Chris Kenny, Kevin Donnelly, Lauren Rosewan and Antoinette Latouf. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.